I am primarily a writer of nonfiction. And one of the things I cherish most as a writer is the relationship that arises with my subjects, the people I write about. In the course of my work, I've interviewed hundreds of subjects. Among them have been climbers, divers, police officers, coroners, pilots, doctors, artists, archeologists, astrobiologists, those people who seek life in the stars. I've interviewed chefs, historians, monks, farmers, kids, Navy SEALs, the homeless, and the toughest interview of all, my father, shortly before his death. Every one of these conversations has been extremely valuable to me, and most have been fascinating. Most have surprised me. Many years ago, in an attempt to better understand the nature of the writer's relationship to his subject, I wrote the following. For the arguably mercenary purpose of his story, the writer affixes his attention to his subject like a barnacle to a ship's hull for a period of weeks or months until and even after the story is complete. Like an obsessive parent, the writer who is doing his job must interrogate the subject to a point just shy of harassment, must observe his every word and move. He must try above all to see the world through his subject's eyes." End quote. Again and again, often against their better judgment, my subjects have trusted me with their stories and their inner lives, and I have worked to earn that trust. In many cases, while climbing or diving, for example, with my subjects, my life has depended on their judgment and attention, and in some cases, vice versa. Many have become friends. One of the subjects I came to know best and felt closest to was the late climber and rope jumper, Dan Osman. While it's been close to 20 years since Dan died in a fall in Yosemite at the age of 35, many of you, I hope, may know of Dan and his work. Dano, as he was called, was based in South Lake Tahoe, and he put up many of the most beautiful lines at Cave Rock and elsewhere. I first met him on assignment for the Atlantic Monthly and went on to spend a great deal of time with him while researching my first book, An Exploration of Risk and the Subculture of Rock Climbing, part memoir and part profile of Dan and his circle. At one point, well into my research, he and I stopped for dinner at a little Italian place in South Lake Tahoe. I think it's still there. And I did another interview running the tape while he talked. He spoke of his daughter, Emma, whom he adored. And we talked about his high-risk lifestyle, most notably his speed free soloing and experimental rope jumping. I finally asked him if he could actually imagine a life that was satisfying to him, that would not require risking that life nearly every day. I wasn't judging him, I just wanted to know. I wasn't a fraction of the climber he was, but I had my own complex relationship to fear and risk, and I thought the reader would want to know too. He stopped eating and sank into thought, and then he looked up at me and swore at me, not unkindly, and tears suddenly filled his eyes. He was not a, a weepy kind of guy. I've never thought of that, he said. And then, no, I don't think I could. We had many of these kinds of exchanges and many good times out climbing at the pie shop or ice climbing late at night under headlamps at Emerald Bay. He was deeply modest, despite his extraordinary talents, unfailingly kind to everyone he met, in my experience and a superb teacher. I miss him. And every time I come through Tahoe, I look up at these beautiful hills, and part of me thinks, Dan, what happened? Where'd you go? Writers are often forced into the position of the other or the outsider, especially in the field. This runs counter to what appears to be a deeply hardwired desire to belong, to be brought inside the circle. Through history, being cast out has often been seen as a greater punishment than execution. While reporting a story, there are countless moments in which I'm made starkly aware that I am the Flatlander, the Cherry, the FNG. I was once asked to come speak to a class of elementary school kids about writing. They were most interested in the life of a writer. So I told them that while I was waiting to come into their class, I'd stood outside in the drizzling rain and watched them through the window as they bustled around in their warm, well-ordered classroom. And I thought, 
Here I am again, looking in at another world. A bit like Grendel, the monster in Beowulf, peering into the golden hall of Hera. There's an element of comfort in that solitude, I told them. It's usually quiet, and others expect little of you, but it can be lonely. And the deep part of your mind that wouldn't know a writer from a wolf wonders why you were out there. What did you do wrong? In the best ways and the worst ways, I told them finally, writing is a solitary path. The students were solemn. And I could see most of them thinking, well, the hell with that. <laughs> but one or two of them appeared to gleam with the knowledge. That's us, their eyes seem to say. Mainstream culture, of course, teaches us to seek security and power. Much of this appears to be in our biology. This organism we scuttle around in has a vested interest in not getting hit by a logging truck. The gene seems to have one real mission, stick around long enough to make a few copies. So there's a powerful imperative to play it safe, to fit in, to show strength. You've heard very eloquently and beautifully today from this young man on this imperative, which is largely social as well, of course. We learn to hide weakness and ignorance. Historically, unless you were the Roman Emperor Claudius, who faked stupidity to avoid being poisoned by his relatives, being the dumbest guy in the room was a good way to end up broke and alone. And yet, in the worlds of my subjects, I'm rarely more than incompetent. Sometimes I'm entirely illiterate and dysfunctional. I'm the guy who points and asks, what's that thing? When that thing is as familiar to my companions as a hammer to a blacksmith. Sometimes they laugh good-naturedly in amazement. So I often hear that cheerful, obnoxious inner voice that says, yeah, that's right. You don't know a damn thing. The older I get, the more I come to appreciate that voice. Growing up as the youngest of four kids with a short-tempered father in this culture, I did my best to conceal my ignorance, which was and remains considerable. In turn, I grew into an arrogant and bullheaded adolescent and did my best to exude knowledge and competence of whatever kind seemed called for. I was far more concerned with what I did know or what I thought I knew than with all the critical things I didn't know. This began to change as I became a writer and started working with subjects at the top of their games. These men and women were masters in the medieval sense of their trades, and I finally began to understand how much I could learn if I just shut my mouth and paid attention. I was once out with a veteran climber who asked if I knew how to set a multi-point anchor. I had been setting anchors for years, but I caught myself. I've set a few, I conceded, but I'd like to see how you do it. So he showed me. He talked about variations, things he might do in different conditions or if lacking certain gear. I learned a few things, and I thanked him. How much better, I realized, than simply saying, yep, I'm good, and pushing on. This was also better for the reader, I realized. Many readers have never set any kind of anchor at sea or on land, and many never will. It doesn't mean they can't be interested. And despite how much I value my relationships with my subjects, I do believe that the writer's greatest responsibility lies with that reader. Whether I'm taking notes on a ledge or shaping a paragraph, I remind myself that if the reader doesn't get it, I've failed. So I try to serve as a kind of bridge, connecting worlds and individuals to readers who in many cases may never get the chance to know them otherwise. Years later, while I interviewed the pastry chef at a three-star restaurant in Paris, he went through the objects in a drawer and cleaned them as he answered my questions. They weren't cooking tools, mind you, but office supplies. With an immaculate white rag in one hand, he pulled out and wiped down each pen, <coughs> rubber band, and bottle of whiteout. He pulled out a small cup of paper clips, the French call them trombones, and he polished each paper clip individually, perfectly. At first I thought, this guy is a genius with pastry, but that's out there. Who polishes a paper clip? <laughs> and then I remembered similar times in the field when climbers and divers and sailors and expedition leaders and skiers, I'm sure, had shown the same attention to minute details, even when they didn't appear to have an impact on performance or safety. 
call them compulsive, but these were the folks I wanted on my belays, right? Setting my cave lines, mixing my nitrots. The chef's fastidious attention was part of his mastery. So now, do I polish my paper clips? No, but perhaps I should. <laughs> Sometimes there's an element of superstition in the writer's role as apprentice. I once wrote a piece on blue holes for National Geographic and had to get certified as a cave diver to report the story. Each morning in the Bahamas, en route to these spectacularly beautiful caves, my instructor had a Jamaican jerk chicken sandwich and a 16 ounce Mountain Dew for breakfast. Every morning, I asked him. Yep, he said, it was part of his ritual. As much as I'm a slave to caffeine, I don't normally pop a Mountain Dew when I get up. For one thing, my wife wouldn't allow it. You might as well drink antifreeze, she'd say. <laughs> but my instructor had made thousands and thousands of cave dives, many of them very complex and committed, often alone. And he had made it back every time. I had three young kids and no interest whatever in drowning in a cave. So I adopted his breakfast through the training. If it was good enough for him, I figured it was good enough for me. Drinking that cold, neon green, jacked up soda first thing in the morning felt like an obscure, possibly magic insurance policy. <laughs> While writing is almost always difficult as a craft and as a livelihood, it's been a fine teacher. I'm grateful to it the way we're grateful for a climbing route at the outside edge of our ability. And if there's anything I've learned in wilderness or so-called civilization, it's that we truly know almost nothing at all, given the subtleties in play. That every situation is astonishingly new. And that the expert, the surgeon, the base jumper, the parent, the writer, is only an expert if she stays authentically humble, despite her vast experience, and remembers all the things she doesn't know and says, hey, wait a second, what's that thing? Thank you very much.